Hello, church family. Uh, let's commit this time to prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would use this message in my heart and the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So this is uh, the first commemorative Electronic Sunday, and it's a milestone in the history of our church. Uh, we're not sleep, uh, live streaming right now, maybe someday. We're not a high tech church, maybe someday. But we're doing this because of coronavirus concerns. And so uh, for this reason alone, I'm going to go with dub this Corona Sunday. Um, I hope you like that one. It'll be forever etched in our hearts and minds. So earlier in the week, I was asking the Lord to uh, give me an appropriate scripture uh, for what's going on in our society these days. And it, and it came to me in the early morning hours sometime uh, Wednesday, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning. And it was John chapter 16, verse 33. Uh, these things, Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Uh, this is a very, very fitting verse as we go through the lifestyle adjustments with, uh, with the coronavirus situation taking place. And I just want to have a brief word about this time. Uh, the media is in a coronavirus news cycle, and that's really good for them because it helps with their ratings. Uh, I believe that there's a lot of hype and hysteria that's being bought and sold these days. Uh, folks, this is not the end of the world. Uh, is it more deadly than the flu? Apparently, much more deadly. But in keeping things in perspective, we do not panic. This is not the bubonic plague. Uh, yes, precautions need to be taken. You practice good hygiene. We stay hydrated. We eat the right things. We get the proper sleep. And we embrace the recommended guidelines by the state and federal authorities. And we also pray for God's protection and safety. Uh, that, that his safety and protection be upon our loved ones and ourselves, our church family, our friends. And we pray that God grants the medical community the wisdom to come up with a vaccine as soon as possible. So back to the scripture at hand, John chapter 16, verse 33. Uh, Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you. And in context here, this is the upper room discourse. And these are things that Jesus told his disciples the night before he died. The Upper Room Discourse is John chapter 13 through John chapter 17. Now, folks, if you were to read those chapters, the Lord Jesus had a lot to share, and the disciples that evening had an awful lot to process. And that is no different for each and every one of us today. So what are some of the topics the Lord spoke about in these chapters? Well, let's quickly run through them. We have servanthood and love, his departure, we have oneness with the Father. We have the role of the Holy Spirit. We have the union that we have with Christ, the parable of the vine and the branches and bearing fruit. We also have in John 16, relating to the disciples, other disciples, the disciples' relationship to the world, the promised Holy Spirit, Jesus for telling his death and resurrection, and then Jesus made some prayer promises to his disciples. Now, it's interesting, if you take a look at the text, in verse 33, it mentions, these things I have spoken to you. And then in the next verse, John chapter 1, verse 17, it also says, these things Jesus spoke to his disciples. And so these things are being emphasized by Christ specifically. Now, if you take a look at verse 33, there are four key words that are mentioned in John chapter 16, verse 33, that I want to highlight today. Uh, peace, tribulation, courage, and overcoming. So a word about peace. In this verse, Jesus spoke of peace being found in him. He is our peace. Peace with God comes to us through our Lord Jesus Christ because he reconciles us to God. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. But this is a reference to salvation peace. God's wrath is removed from the newly found believer. But in John chapter 16, verse 33, the peace that Jesus is talking about is a relational peace uh, in him. 
And it's a peace that's related to one's walk and fellowship. It's a peace that comes when we're in step with the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah spoke of this peace. Uh, I like the way the New King James Version expresses this. But in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, Isaiah wrote, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So Isaiah is talking about a steadfast mindset, and it's a mindset that is fixed on God. The Apostle Paul reinforces this thought in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, when he said, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Literally, that to act as an arbiter. Now, you probably know what an arbiter is or an arbitrator, but it's one who officially seeks to settle a dispute. And so in this case, the choice is, we either have peace in Christ or we have no peace. That's a huge choice. In times like these, we cannot let our minds gravitate to a worldly mindset. Uh, we cannot let the news cycle dominate our thinking. We can't let the government dictate our thinking. And we can't let the world act as an arbiter in our, in our thinking. Uh, the world, the government, the news cycle, the media, they are not in the peace business. They're in the turmoil business. Uh, the peace of Christ comes when we walk with him and we appropriate him. Uh, the, the scripture talks about clothing ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. It, it means spending time in his word, which is so essential. It means listening and praying and reflecting and meditating on God's word and what he's saying to our heart. It, it's having his mind and having his perspective. And folks, that is huge. This is huge for the time in which we, we live in. So daily, we have a choice. We let the flesh and the world dominate, or we let God's heart and mind dominate and act as arbiter. What do you want? Of course, God, God's heart and mind acting as arbiter. Uh, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, the, the apostle Paul spoke of bringing every thought captive. Now, folks, that's a lot of thoughts. Years ago, I read an article that said we have about 20 to 30,000 thoughts that go through our minds daily. With the news cycle these days, maybe more. So I would remind you what the proverb says in Proverbs 23, verse 7. It says, as a man thinks, so he is. And, and what we're seeing here in many quarters of the world today is we're, we're seeing panic. We're not seeing peace. We're seeing fear. We're not seeing the peace of God dominate the hearts and minds of people. God tells us that we have peace in him. We're not to panic. We fear not. Now, the next thing, the next word I want to bring to your attention is the word tribulation. Uh, this word is actually the word for trouble or affliction. Uh, and this word is also generally associated with persecution and affliction in the faith, in the Christian faith. And it has the potential to positively or negatively affect the believer's faith. Now, I, I did a, a word search on this, but this word occurs 45 times in Scripture and in primarily three categories. Dealing with end times, trouble and affliction. Trouble or affliction as it is associated in the Christian life. Or tribulation as it is associated in being a witness for Christ. And it's interesting what the Apostle Paul wrote about tribulation in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. And he expresses how believers should embrace such tribulation. He says, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. So... Tribulation, uh, trouble and affliction is, is something that we all go through. But it's designed to make us stronger. It refines our faith. And what we should do is we should think about it as it making us and forcing us to put down deep spiritual roots. Now, the coronavirus is not tribulation in the sense of how the scripture uses the word. But there are many that are tribulated today. There are many that are troubled and afflicted with what's happening. 
And everyone process things differently. Uh, I'm actually bothered by the response because I believe that the response is actually worse than the virus itself. Um, I'm not afflicted with the, the, the disease, praise God, and I'm not troubled in any other sense of the way by this. But it's very important how we process, how we think. We need to be mindful that God is in control, not the coronavirus. We need to be mindful that God is in control, not the government. The news cycle is not in control. The media outlets are not in control. God is in control. And so we understand that. As we understand this and we remind ourselves of this, we can rest more fully in him. Now, on Wednesday nights, we've been studying the book of Revelation. And so the question is, is the coronavirus panic uh, or what's happening during our time, is, is this uh, a prelude of things to come? Is this like an end time event? I don't think it's an end time event, but I believe that it's a prelude of things to come. Um, is it revelation-like in terms of its quality? I don't think so. If we were to have a global financial crash, then I would have a different opinion. But I see this current situation as a refining process. I see it as a dry run. It's a, f a phase of preparing for what is, what could be, and what will be in the days to come, if the Lord tarries. So let's come back to the scripture here, because remember, what did Jesus say? He said, in the world you have tribulation. Uh, brothers and sisters, this is the world. The world has always been in tribulation. It will always be in tribulation. It's the world. Uh, what did Job say? Man is born into trouble. Uh, Job chapter 5, verse 7. Affliction and trouble is a part of the human experience. And yet Jesus did not, if you look at this text, Jesus did not leave us with tribulation having the final word. In fact, what he said uh, to all believers is, take courage, I have overcome the world. Now, when I hear the word courage, I often think of the lion and the Wizard of Oz, you know, where he runs around and he says, I need courage. I also think, when I think of courage, I also think of our great uh, men and women in the military, especially the special operations officers, SEAL Team 6, Delta Force, the Rangers, the Marines, uh, these special uh, men that uh, it, it display tremendous courage, uh, especially during uh, wartime. So I, I decided to look up the definition courage. And um, courage, uh, bravery, valor, bravado, it refers to qualities of spirit and conduct. Courage permits one to face extreme dangers and difficulties without fear. So we can take courage or we can lose courage. Bravery implies true courage with daring and intrepid, or that is fearless, boldness. Bravery in battle. So that's a, that's a definition. And Jesus reminds us to take courage or to be encouraged. And, not, and my takeaway with this is don't cower in the face of tribulation. Do not lose heart. Now, I believe everyone has courage. Uh, some people have more courage than others. Uh, the question that I, the questions I ask, what brings out courage? Or maybe perhaps I should say, who brings out the courage? In, in context here, I understand courage to be God-given. Yes, some have it more than others, but it's something that comes out during trying and difficult times. It may have something to do with personality and how we're wired, or it may have something to do with the person's biological constitution. But in the text, it's clearly God-given. Uh, what did Peter say, uh, I'm sorry, Paul say to Timothy? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, literally, lack of courage or confidence, but one of power and love and discipline. Proverbs 28 verse one says, the righteous are as bold as a lion. So courage is God given and God reminds his children all throughout the scriptures 
to take courage and to be encouraged. Why? Because the battle is the Lord's, the victory is his. Now, if you take a look at the text, I want you to notice that courage is connected and linked to overcoming. Now, the word in the Greek for overcome is literally Nike. It means, it's not the sneaker, it means victory or to prevail. And so Jesus says to his disciples, I have overcome the world. Uh, brothers and sisters, this is a profound statement, and I want you to think about it. Christ has overcome the world. The Son of God has perfectly overcome the world. Now, what does it mean to overcome the world? It means to be victorious over its principles, its victory over, uh, its victory over a thought process and a way of thinking. It's gaining the victory over the worldly values. It's victory over sin. It's victory over a certain way of doing or not doing, of going forth in the world and being in the world, but not of it. So Jesus Christ is an overcomer. Jesus Christ is our overcomer. Because he overcame and prevailed, we overcome and prevail. And this is why he tells us to take courage. It's a way of life for Christ. It's a way of life and thinking for the Christian. As you know, Christ defeated the devil, the God of this world on his own turf. He disarms the principalities and powers at the cross, Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. And so, because we're in him, we also defeat the devil and the world, and we're able to disarm all the fiery darts of the devil and the things that are sent and come our way. How do we do this? We don't do it in our own power. We do it in him. We appropriate him. We clothe ourselves with him. It's living in him, and as we do that, we overcome. We do it based on God-given knowledge and wisdom that we have in Christ that comes out of the Holy Scriptures that are able to make us wise unto salvation. We understand that we're in him and that he is with us. We understand that he's for us and not against us. We know that we are overcomers because he overcame. We overcome and we will continue to overcome. Now, it's important to understand that this does not mean that we do not spiritually falter or fail in the process. And I think you all know that if you're a believer. This does not mean that we're constantly victorious in the Christian life and in our walk. This does not mean that we do not lose spiritual battles with the flesh and sin. But it does mean, Proverbs 24, verse 16, for a righteous man, though he falls, he rises seven times, he rises again, or he gets up. I love that verse. We just looked at finishing uh, up some of the Peter stories. And we looked at some of Peter's comments and statements and his journey in in the time that he walked with the Lord. And you know that Peter fell short. Peter failed time and again, and yet Peter's an overcomer because it was the Lord Jesus Christ who constantly picked him up when he fell. And it's also the Lord Jesus Christ who constantly picks us up when we fall too. It's the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit who spoke these things to the heart of Peter. And he also speaks these same things to all of our hearts as well. So in closing, this current news cycle is tribulating to a lot of people. And I would say to you, don't let it happen. Don't be tribulated. Be at peace. As we live in Christ, have his peace. Uh, take courage in your Savior. Uh, the Lord Jesus has a lot of courage to dish out. Amen? He, he overcame. We overcome also. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for the peace that we have through our Lord Jesus Christ and how you reconciled us to yourself, and thank you, Lord, uh, for the peace that we're able to have 
in you daily. Uh, we thank you that uh, trials and tribulations, uh, afflictions and trouble uh, make us stronger. And we thank you for that. And we uh, thank you, Lord, that we're able to take courage because you have overcome the world. Uh, bless your people, uh, each and every heart that would listen to this message, uh, that they might be strengthened to that end. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.